Welcome to the Not So Cool Kids Podcast, episode 43. We've got uh, two special guests, uh, hopefully, on with us today. Uh, one uh, is is someone you may have heard of recently. He's kind of uh, launched something pretty recently that's it's kind of exciting for all of the, uh, the all of nerdum, if you will. Uh, Houston Huddleston. Uh, he has actually worked on a, another project prior. It's called uh, Star Trek Enterprise D Bridge Restoration. You may have heard that before. He basically uh, found a, uh, a bridge that uh, was thrown out from the original project uh, of Star Trek uh, Enterprise and uh, wanted to restore it. So he kickstarted uh, the idea of restoring it and has brought it to many conventions and, and stuff around the country. Got a lot of attention that way. And now he's working on a really awesome idea, kind of parlaying the, uh, the bridge project into uh, actually making it into a sci-fi Hollywood sci-fi museum, which is kind of going to be like the mecca of all sci science fiction, everything that you could think of, and we'll talk to him a little bit about that. But man, is that exciting. And then, of course, uh, we're going to have uh, another gentleman on with us, hopefully a little bit later, but Justin uh, Draplin, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, who's uh, working on a project called the Super Run, which is going around the country and it's uh, cosplay, but it's like a run and a walk thing. But anyways, Houston, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, I, I really yeah, get to but... talk uh, with uh, the uh, not so cool kids. I'm usually only. <laughs> it's kind of a play on words because. It's funny how all the not so cool kids are now the cool kids, but it's incredible the way things have turned around in the last five ten years. Yeah, it's okay to be smart now. It's it's <laughs> it, that's that's a good thing. Well, it's, it's amazing. Like, I was oh, gonna go say, ahead. It's like we've taken back our word of a nerd or geek, where it used yeah. to be the the worst curse word you could call somebody, and now it's. Uh, you know, people are calling uh, themselves that and calling the names of their shows that and, and all, all the rest of it, which is wonderful. Absolutely. And I, we always say it's like it's like that uh, the table in the cafeteria in your high school, you know, that had all the, the nerdy kids who would just talk about the coolest uh, things on TV and movies coming up and stuff. And and it, it's, it's become uh, a thing now where that, that's not frowned upon and it's actually embraced um, yeah. the the conventions around the country even the small ones are getting huge population uh, coming through their doors so that's that's really exciting and also um, the, the nicest and the most beautiful girls are dressing up in costume and right uh, so it's it's a wonderful thing uh, for for everyone not not on not just on that level but I mean it's uh, uh, my gosh, you know, it was like a closet thing you had to do to say that you were a Star Trek fan, and now, yes, between Firefly, between Joss Whedon, all that, and Avengers now. I mean, like it or not, Avengers and X uh, X Men, they're not comic book things; they're sci fi films. You know, I mean, let's call it for what they are. Yeah. Yep, and, and, and the they deal with really. Of all films. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and they deal with. Um, topics that I think uh, us as a society can relate to, especially Star Trek uh, being, I mean, it, it really addressed some issues far beyond its years when, you know, even the earlier years with Spock, you know, confronting different, uh, you know, then species and different, um, you know, intergalactic uh, powers that be, if you will, and having to kind of say, what are we going to do? Let's let's fight for peace and let's like discover the new world. I mean, that's kind of the direction we're going in with science, but it's also a direction we're going in with our society. We all need to kind of meet at the same table and, and you know. Well, it's about inspiration. It's about trying to give someone a hopeful message, and no matter what... No matter how rotten things are, that if we look beyond where we are and we try to figure out how we can make things better, it's it was 
Gene Roddenberry's utopian vision from the get-go. And that's, let's face it, if there hadn't been a Star Trek, we wouldn't have cell phones, We at least not as soon. We certainly yeah. wouldn't have had touchscreen computers as quickly. Uh, and what, what I'm wearing now and what Google Glass and all the rest of it, all those things were things that Michael Okuda and Rick Sternbach and Gene Roddenberry certainly. And, uh, you know, if it weren't for uh, David Gerald, we wouldn't have triples. <laughs> No, but seriously, with all the other stuff, um, you know, we're we're at a place now that those visionaries and creative, brilliant people had, they did come up with something. No matter how silly or ridiculous they thought it might have been at the time, mm-hmm. there were people like uh, uh, Bill Gates and, uh, you know, he all these people came up with stuff and said, huh, oh, maybe, you know, this, this is, this is something really cool that we could create for real. Yeah. And, and tell us a little bit about, uh, the first, this one kind of, that kind of sparked the whole thing is that you, you, you actually found a Star Trek Enterprise D bridge just right. sitting in the trash. No, it was sitting behind a warehouse for years and years, and it was made for a tour that they did, because the original set was destroyed when they crashed the ship at the end of Generations in 2000, oh. I mean, 1994. Uh, that was the original set, and it was just, it was bulldozed. It was gone. That was it. Hmm. So they built this one, and they built the ones at Vegas, the Experience, at the same time okay. in the late 90s. And the Vegas ones were also destroyed when they finished that in 10 years. And this was forgotten about and left behind a warehouse. And then Paramount changed hands, sold everything to CBS, Viacom, blah, 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 all the uh, legalities of it all. And my set fell through the cracks. And when I found out about it, you know, it was panic time. And I just, I had one week to figure it out. It was one of those things, and I, I'm not a rich person, so I didn't know really what I was going to do with it. Yeah. I, could, I just knew that if I didn't do this, that I was going to probably regret it for the rest of my life, and I, I may still end up regretting it for the rest of my life if, if the museum doesn't work out. But no, uh, honestly, I, I just knew it was the right thing, and I knew it was uh, – uh, I don't know how many uh, – people watching this are religious at all, but I, I saw it as a gift from God saying, okay, boom, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're going to be a schmuck or you're not. And there you go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, and luckily Ronald E. Moore and Brent Spiner who played data and, uh, Bill Shatner, uh, sent us, uh, headshots and stuff, you know, to, to help with a Kickstarter. And there've been a lot of people who in and outside the industry, uh, Jane Espenson, who wrote pretty much every show on television <laughs> and produced uh, from Battlestar to Buffy to Once Upon a Time, she's wow. donated a thing on our recent Kickstarter uh, dinner with our drinks with Jane Espenson. You know, just these people want to see this happen. And yeah, uh, it what happened was they helped me with the initial bridge restoration Kickstarter. And mm-hmm. then after that, uh, I had the same problem I had before I got the, the, the Kickstarter, which was none of the big companies wanted to help me because they didn't have any rights with Star Trek. There was no way for them to make any money from it. Okay. And they didn't see, see the bigger picture. They, yeah. They saw it as the bridge was minutia compared to a larger picture of there being a museum. Where do you put the bridge once it's restored? Oh, right. uh, well, you know, it's one of those things. Um, so, yeah, that's it. This has all been, this is all the same project. It's just we were at a point where we either move forward or we right. dissolve the whole or thing. Or you're stagnant. Yeah. Once you're stagnant, you go backwards. Because right. Because we still have to pay those bills. We still have to, you know, any storage, any shipping, any uh, the legal fees, the paying the i the IRS with the the five hundred one c three the nonprofit that we have, and mm-hmm. all those things those are monthly bills whether we make money or not. And so it was move to the next umpteenth degree or 
give it up because this two years that I've been doing this for free, I have made no money myself and that's been a killer. Wow. So until we get to sure. the next step, I can't make a salary. None of our board members can uh, work and help us like Rick Sternbach and all of these brilliant people, Andrew Probert. None of them can do their job like mm -hmm. creating new things for our museum, you know, all the rest until we get to the next step. Now, you've taken this bridge around to conventions. I've seen pictures. Oh, many. 23 what? now. Different conventions. What, what's been the reaction? What's what's the reaction from the fans? and the? Oh, they hate it. They, hate it. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely, as soon as they saw it, they were like, no, no, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah. They, they, what's this crap? No, <laughs> you know, they, um... I've had as young as like 10 year olds come over and say, Oh my God, it's the bridge of the enterprise because their parents showed them Star Trek next gen. That's amazing. Which is so awesome, you know? And, but then, you know, as, as young as that and as old as uh, people in their seventies coming up and uh, wow. complaining that it's not the original series. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, that is joking. funny because, I, I just, um, well, we're going to be interviewing uh, Vic from Star Trek Continues. Vic uh, Mignogna. No, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and he, uh, you know, I saw uh, the second episode, which was really cool, and I'm looking at this, this set that they're using, and I'm like, holy cow, this thing is amazing, and... I'm sure all the old school uh, Trek fans are just absolutely going bonkers for That's the series. Funny. Did you know that I wrote the second one? I didn't. Oh, okay, yeah. Lilani. Is that the one with with uh, Lou Ferrigno in it? Yeah, right. And the, the oh I my god, I dude, I absolute no, no kidding. It felt so like the original series. Oh, he's I got chills. No, he's in uh, the whole look of it, the yeah, uh, everything, every element of it. Uh, Vic is obsessive to the point of what Gene Roddenberry was to make sure that it's a thousand percent dead on. You know? Yeah, but I applaud you. I mean, the writing was phenomenal. So <laughs> well, I mean, the thing was, uh, we, I didn't have a chance to do the final draft of it because I was that was in August, the beginning of August. Uh, yeah, end of July, August, where we had four events in a row. We had wow. San Diego Comic Con, Star Trek Vegas, um, Houston, Texas, and a thing called the Geeky Awards, an award show in LA. And it was no time, no time to breathe in between that. So I did, I think, two drafts of it, and then uh, I didn't write the final draft. But uh, the uh, Vic and I. Um, worked as much together as we could but no that was his that's his baby and the new one my gosh i can't tell you well i guess have you seen the poster for the new one because you can guess i haven't and he he kind of teased it at the panel that i was at but i had to leave to get another interview in like in the middle of the panel and i was like man i want to stay and i want to hear what he's got to say about this next one but he i didn't get to hear it so if you see the poster you'll know exactly what it's about and it's okay. awesome it's uh, it really it's really amazing. Awesome. It's just a it's a fantastic web series and and something that uh, I think is to the level at web content is starting to get better and this is a perfect example of it. Oh, I you know? totally agree. I totally agree. Well, it's also with pros. These are not. Yeah. Uh, you Absolutely. know, these are not people doing it in their their basement. You know, it's uh, exactly. And I mean, I'm not trying to kick those people in the butt it's just when you have when you surround yourself with professionals and brilliant right. people it's the thing with my project I, I i wouldn't have gotten this far if i didn't have the the legends of star trek on our board of directors ronald e moore uh, larry nimichek oh. uh doug drexler uh rick sternbach andrew probert um david you want to get larry on too i really want to yeah. get larry on the show he's a great guy such a just really honest, sincerely great guy. And the knowledge that he has of Star Trek is phenomenal. I only got to talk to him for a couple of minutes at Midwest Media Expo where they were at, 
And I'll tell you what, like the five seconds I was talking to him, oh yeah, I'm working on this project and I got this going. I'm like, how's he juggling all that? I mean, the guy must be like a like a, you know a, a, an encyclopedia of Star Trek knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, uh, he was the first one that uh, got all the others to me because I didn't know uh, any of them. I ran into Ron Moore, whom I didn't know, and he was busy and all that, and I just started showing him photos of the dilapidated bridge, and he was, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, that's, and I said, would you help me on this? Because nobody knows who I am. And he said, yeah, yes, of course. What do you, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and the same with Noreen Shankar, who uh, started out as a technical consultant, scientific consultant for next gen and then went on to uh be writer producer on csi and uh wow. gosh what else um uh, oh a farscape he was on <laughs> he uh he was a writer and producer on farscape and uh outer limits the redone version these sort of people it's uh you know this is their this is their bridge and right. now that we're making the museum, which is not just Star Trek, but uh, Battlestar Galactica and Firefly and uh, Doctor Who and Star Wars, of course, uh, I I can open up the the boundaries to ask many more people uh, to help us and not be embarrassed or you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Still, who the hell am I? You know, I still always just say that uh, I'm just this. I'm the schmuck who found the bridge, but I did have enough sense to surround myself with people much more brilliant and much more famous than I. Well, yeah, and I was going to say, you know, it only takes one idea, and, and everything starts with an idea. Mm -hmm. And really, once uh, an idea is out there, it's it's the people that gather around it that really make it special. So t tell us a little bit about what we can look forward to with this Hollywood Science Fiction Museum, well, what what what's what's the uh, what's the beats? <laughs> yeah, the beats. Well, the first beat is please support us on Kickstarter because if, of course. So we uh, get that money. Uh, we won't have the money to get to the next step, which is to approach the bigger companies. It's sure. not what I didn't understand, and what most people don't understand is you can't approach. Bill Gates and uh, <laughs> Microsoft and Google and all these people, unless you have your prospectus, your concept art, your uh, a a budget that uh, com a comparative budget, plus you need a whole staff of people to make the phone calls and the emails. People who are used to doing this. Oh yeah. Uh, no matter how many volunteers you get, you can't get volunteers who have done that before that are going to work that many hours for free. Right. And also all those materials, uh, you they just cost a hell of a lot of money. Um, so yeah, I number one, I'd say go to our Kickstarter. Uh, you can go, you can look hollywoodsci-fi.com.org or you can just go to Kickstarter and look under Hollywood Science Fiction Museum. Any, if you type in Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum on the internet now, it's hard not to find something about us because we've just we've been very fortunate so far to be on CBS, NBC, uh, Sci-Fi, Blaster, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, it's just getting the word out and letting people know that every dollar counts. But anyway, um, about our museum, uh, this is we're gonna have a 2015 opening, mm -hmm. and it will be the Enterprise D bridge complete completed. Uh, I don't know how interactive it will be by that point. It'll probably still be, you know, a stagnant set that... Yeah, the rushed. early stages. Yeah, because we're rushing it. Um, but what it will do is it will have uh, uh, a lot of the cast and crew talking about Star Trek and how far we've come and how Star Trek did change the world and how it will continue to change the world and hmm. create astronauts and scientists at NASA and X, SpaceX and uh, Boeing and all these other uh, brilliant 
<laughs> people coming coming out of the woodwork because they love Star Trek. Um, it will have a Doctor Who TARDIS. It will have uh, both the blue box as well as walking in and you see the TARDIS console. Amazing. Um, it'll have displays and costumes and props from all the franchises uh, that we can find stuff or borrow stuff or, or steal stuff. <laughs> um <laughs> No, it's it's hard to find little ladies to mug that, you know, you want to borrow my tricorder? No, you know, you don't see that often. But, uh, no, but there are a lot of fans coming out of the woodwork now offering us things that they have never offered to any other museum, which is miraculous. Uh, yeah, there's there. a lot of collections out there that are really guarded... Uh guarded items that people really uh the value is is far far greater than the dollar bill it's yeah. the sentimental value and a it's project like, like this that that really puts it on a pedestal and says hey don't put it in your closet man but put it in this you know let yeah. people experience it and love it and while at the same time you know we're guarding it and keeping it safe for you well it's also telling them that we're not taking it in perpetuity forever and ever and if our thing went down the commode that your items would be auctioned off right given to somebody that you don't care about um some people are donating their items but most people are loaning their items which i prefer because that way i don't have the responsibility of uh you yeah. know what happens if everything hits the fan but um it's you know some of them are longer loans than others but still that they're trusting us with one-of-a-kind items uh, and what we can't find or what is so beat up because it's an original and it was dropped so many god knows how many times uh, we're making replicas of which are just as good because it's still from the original molds absolutely that's great and and I, I mean you guys have part parts of that I've seen on your uh, Kickstarters you got like a haul of robots Yes, interactive. Robots. Yes, right. I'm not sure how many we're going to be able to get for the 2015 opening because sure. the one that the one that Grand Imahera hosts is the one the 2018 2019 version, which is a lot of money and huge and massive. And that's I, the big goal, right? Oh that's yeah. The, the 2018 is the. I, I was looking at your timeline. 2018 is the opening of the actual museum, not the the launch museum. Yeah, well, the Launch Museum still is going to be very cool. Because oh, the Launch sure. Museum will still have stuff in it that nobody else has and that there's nothing in Hollywood like it. Uh, there was, back in the late 90s, I heard, there was a bridge, a Star Trek bridge, but it wasn't the entire bridge. Hmm. And let's face it, it wasn't like what we got. Uh, but we're going to have a hall of robots in all of the rooms that we're going to have in the final huge museum. Is going to, They're all going to be represented in our 2015 museum. There's going to be the Hall of Robots. We'll have Robbie the Robot. We'll probably have Terminator. We'll probably have uh, – we'll set, definitely have a, a Cyberman and a, a Dalek. Um, wow. And I'm not sure how interactive they're going to be, but what will be interactive is the information in front of them, a touchscreen computer where you'll see Matt Smith talking about a Cyberman, uh, Karen Gillan talking about a Dalek. And then you'll have the real NASA astronaut uh, – not astronauts for that, but the real NASA uh, scientists talking about how far we are from creating a real cybernetic uh, humanoid, uh, yeah. bionics, how far we've come into that. Plus NASA, um, I don't mind dropping name-dropping. I visited with them two months ago. I met with their uh, – some very high ups there and we were talking about the 2015 museum as well as what how copacetic NASA can be with what we're doing to teach STEM based education uh, wow. as well as uh, as well as filmmaking as well as inspiration not everybody is going to come to our museum and want to be an astronaut or scientist or mathematician. Sure. I don't. I'm horrible at math. I suck at math and science. <laughs> I'm the first to admit it. But if you give people a choice, if they're interested in costuming, they'll go to check out the costumes. If they're interested in prosthetics or makeup, they'll go to that room. Uh, if they yeah. want to be a filmmaker, they'll listen to hopefully Lucas or Spielberg, uh, a video of them talking about what it takes to make a science fiction movie. Or... Uh, footage of Asimov or Bradbury or our own uh, 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 David Gerald talking about uh, what it become, what it's like to, to write a novel or become a writer. 
that's amazing. And there's nothing like yeah. that in the world that you can do that in. Yeah, and, and, and something for everyone, which is really cool. But that's like true. you said, the, the connecting piece that I really think is, is really phenomenal is that the education piece to it. Because at first when I was reading this, I'm like, okay, great, it's going to be a, a prop museum, they're going to have some... Uh, and then I'm, I'm like reading further on, and you and you, you connected it with the education, the linking in, you know, realistic, you know, um, things that are happening now. Mm-hmm. And the science that that's being created right now, that is has been linked to these amazing science fiction, you know, pop culture things that we've watched for years. And now, like you said, there's a there's a connection, and it's going to get people engaged. It's going to get kids engaged, getting excited about science again. You know, and uh, as a country, I think it's so important for us. In the United States, to to get kids excited about that again, we need this to get adults it. excited too. You know, we need Absolutely. to get all ages excited because honestly, if if science had been as fun and cool as what we're going to be doing, I probably wouldn't uh, be as ignorant about it. Let's yeah. be honest. I had the scientists, uh, the science classes that I took were horrible. They were just they were boring. And I couldn't relate, and I didn't care. If it had begun with Star Trek, Star Wars, then I was, hmm, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Draw it people will, in with what they want to know. Absolutely. What they care about. Yeah. And, and no, get them really... excited mm-hmm. that, that they can actually go and actually get into, uh, you know, these amazing vehicles, these... You know, because you also going to have like a, a, I guess you could say a hall of vehicles or hall of cars, yeah. Yeah, hall I of cars. To talk about that, yeah, right. Because that's that's a perfect example. You've got Batmobile, the Kit Car, the, the Back to the Future DeLorean. Uh, the oh, DeLorean, cool. incidentally, the in- interior of that was uh, mostly uh, it was designed by uh, Andrew Probert, who's also on our board of directors. So, say you go to uh, that car, the Back to the Future DeLorean, you sit in it, take photos, get to push the buttons, and then you have <laughs> you have uh, uh, Christopher Lloyd saying, Marty, you've got to do so, you know, telling you all about the car, what it does, how it works, all that stuff, the, the flux capacitor, and then you have the real uh, car manufacturers and the scientists and the people at GM and Elon Musk talking about the future of fuel and it'll all whether it be electronic with his car, with his Tesla car, all it all relates yeah. to each other, and it's it's not forcing it into it. It's natural. It's a natural thing. It's yeah. so amazing to me and exciting. And I I don't I mean we were just talking about this how your 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 science classes just were not that engaging. I agree with that. I don't know why more. Um, and I love this idea because you had mentioned this uh, on a previous interview that I saw, that you could actually take a whole class, take them on the bridge, and have them learning about space. Totally. Like I, I have, I've, I threw in about three or four different options as far as what we could do on the bridge, yeah. where different kids are at different stations. Uh, you could have up to 17 different people on the bridge of the Enterprise working wow. their computers. Because that's the way it was set up. There was a, each station. It wasn't like the first series, the original series, where it was just a bunch of candy, pretty colored buttons. <laughs> right. There's, there's no way to really make that original series bridge truly interactive that you can fly a mission. It's just it wasn't made that way. You'd have to completely redesign it, and that would lose the charm of it. When you get to the next generation. They had real scientists working on this, Michael Lukuda uh, and Rick Sternbach, who were working with NASA, who Mike Okuda got, I mean, uh, Rick Sternbach got off of uh, Cosmos. That was his original training ground. So they wow. thought in scientific terms, and they thought of – everything was very well thought out. And so you do a training class before you get on the bridge. Everyone gets to learn their station, and then – Jean-Luc Picard takes you on a mission 
of whatever. You could fly uh, to a different planet. There could be various, uh, you could encounter an anomaly. And each person at their station would have something to do with that mission. And you'd be graded after that. And there would be higher up missions where if you if you have enough high grades, you can uh, get to his, and you would upgrade your, your position, your rank, and eventually you'd be captain. And there'd be, I, I threw out one thing for Leonard Nimoy, and I hope he will do it. I, I contacted, his agency is where I'm, I have an agent at, uh, and so I contacted them again, and I said, look, I really want Leonard Nimoy to know about us and to be supportive of us, because once he knows about what we're doing, I can't imagine his not wanting to be involved. And I want, I want Ambassador Spock to host a mission called uh, Earth, the Final Frontier, and to start in the 25th century and go encounter a wormhole where you go back into uh, our time. And we discover that if we don't start cleaning up our oceans and we don't start uh, with an ozone layer and everything else that Pat Sajak says that uh, doesn't exist um, – <laughs> Then we're going to be in a lot of trouble, and yeah. uh, you know it's it's a that, very important uh, message. That is an amazing idea. I mean, I'm I'm geeked about it just right now. I'm like, can I be a kid again so I can go through this uh, mission with? It's not oh just for kids. Yeah. Anybody can do this, and, and everyone should do this. You better believe I'm going to be sitting in the captain's chair one of those <laughs> test missions before we open. <laughs> You, there's no way I'm not gonna. I'm, I'll probably try out every station. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, shut up, Wesley. No, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. And yeah, you, and you've got some great items, by the way. We should mention on your Kickstarter that are great. Uh, I guess you could incentives to uh, support this project, like the. Uh, the shut up, Wesley. Uh, you know, bands and the T-shirts and. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, we're not going to forget our roots. I mean, like, Disneyland started with a mouse, and this whole thing started with a bridge. Yeah. And uh, it's it started with three bridges, actually. We have the Enterprise D bridge, and I don't talk much about this, but we also rescued the original series bridge. And wow. So it's not as complete as the D bridge, but we still have it. And there's the NX-01 from Enterprise bridge that... Uh, a good friend of mine owns the entire bridge. Excuse me. And he, um, what he he's in Germany. So what we're gonna do is ship it out in pieces. I did say ship it out. I didn't. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna bring it out here to America. And in Hollywood, we're going to reconstruct it, and we will have the actual uh, NX01 bridge from the show Enterprise. That uh, I don't know how pe much pe how many people will be allowed to touch things as it was the actual set, but sure. people will still be able to walk inside of it and and look around and everything. Which you know, love or hate that show, the bridge was awesome. It was a beautiful set. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there are doors open that you would not imagine, and there are three things. Next week we're going to announce. Uh, there's a member, f uh, a new member of our board of directors. And all I can say is it's a woman, and she she's from NASA. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. That's yeah. exciting. Oh, that I will mean, be a big announcement. <laughs> phenomenal. So, okay, so this is what people can do to get a active and, and engaged in this project is they can go to the Kickstarter, they can support the project, but also share the project. Oh, right? please retweet and share and just spread this word and contact any celebrity you know, have met, whatever. Tell them about this because they probably were involved in some way in some show that we're representing. Lord knows, mm -hmm. this week for me, I've been con I've been burning up my emails and my phones trying to contact everyone from Sir Patrick Stewart to Sigourney Weaver to um, uh, Guillermo del Toro to... Uh, Peter Jackson to uh, everybody, man. I I'm shameless. I I don't mind. What's the worst anyone can say? No, you know. That's I, you just said the best lesson that I learned in my time in life is that if you don't ask, you'll never know. You and know. Most, 
the mentality of most people who are into Star Trek compared to Star Wars, Star Trek fans mm -hmm. are usually very shy. And Star Wars mm -hmm. fans are very outspoken and loudmouthed uh, and wearing their, you know, and that's not a criticism. Because yeah. you look at the 501st, the 501st would not be where it is today if they hadn't stood up and spoken out and tried to do something. And uh, and I, I hope that uh, our Star Trek fans who have supported us and followed us on their, our bridge, our, you know, uh, our Facebook page and our Twitter will be shameless in the in the sense of not the TV show where they're uh, doing everything completely obscene every week, but in the the sense of <laughs> speaking to everybody and just spreading the word about what we're doing, and that's yeah. the only way people are going to know uh, about this. And we I had we had uh, Kevin Pike on the show, and I would have loved to have asked him about about you know, this project, if he knew about it, because, you know, he worked on, he's done special effects for so many movies. I know the name, but that's all I know. Yeah, he, he, he worked on uh, The DeLorean as well, in the original Back to the Future. Wow. And uh, he, he's just an amazing guy to talk to. The stories, the behind-the-scenes stories he was telling us. The first project he ever worked on was Jaws. And wow. just talking to him about how he got hired on in Jaws, and I'm asking him about Bruce and about how you know that worked in seawater, and he goes, he goes, no one ever did it before. It was it was insane. It was crazy that we were doing this, you know. But it's just amazing talking to him. Uh, so, anyways, I want to yeah. be John Dykstra. That's who I want to be. Uh, I I think he'll uh, from Star Wars, of course. Yeah. Um, I I've met most of the Star Trek people. I need to uh, I need to meet. Greg Jean, who is a brilliant, you know, just a ma uh, master prop maker, uh, model maker. And there are a few more people I need to meet with Trek, but I don't have any connections with Star Wars other than I've met his daughter Chloe a few times, who's friend, who's, uh, who dates Chris Hardwick. But, um, you know, there, I now that we're expanding into this massive museum. I, I want to incorporate everyone I can from well, Battlestar Galactica. Ronald D. Moore is on our board, and Jane Espenson is a friend, and I've met most of those cast members. But uh, Star I'm Wars... I'm shocked you haven't been on Nerdist yet, because, I mean, this is like a project that is like, you know... That, yeah, I'm shocked. You know, no, actually, I'm in touch with those guys. I think this next good. week we're going to do it. I think Because do it. Uh, this is, like, this this podcast... I started listening to Nerdist back in the, when you know, it was before it was cool to listen to Nerdist. Yeah. And it really was a show that uh, spoke to that small population that was nerdy and didn't care about the the, the stereotype. So yeah. Yeah. eventually it became something bigger, and that's fine. It, Nerdist is, is bigger now. This show is more trying to get down on the level of the fans and, and getting to talk to the people that, they really haven't been able to talk to, which is just the, the, the people behind the scenes and doing the amazing things like what you're doing. The, the projects that, 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 that you're working on are just phenomenal and are going to be really important. And, and I, I think long, long looking down the line, once this Kickstarter gets completed and you have all the funds to complete this, and I'm saying that because it's going to happen. Well, <laughs> it's the... The thing is, it's it's depending on uh, a time frame and a scope that is uh, it needs to be of a certain time, or it won't happen as smoothly. Let's just say, yeah, because uh, the way that we had it laid out, um, it it made sense, and especially I I don't want to underestimate. This company uh, that we're dealing with, it's uh, who's helping us, called Retroactive, and they were involved early on. That the people from Retroactive used to work for the company that created the experience, the Star Trek experience in Vegas. So they're very familiar with what we're doing. And now, on their own, Retroactive designed the Grammy Museum, and they did the Despicable Me attraction at the uh, at Universal and the. Was the other in Springfield Town for The Simpsons, and they did all that stuff. They know their their work, and they told me dead on, "Look, 
Uh-huh. You give us a little money to uh, – a uh, little money, you know, but if you get the money to get to the next step, we can do the rest because we know how to go to – Google and Microsoft and all the big I, – I definitely want to go corporate. We have to go corporate to get this kind of money to do this. We can't go to fans to get huge millions of dollars. That's asinine. Yeah. So if the fans and, care and, enough to get us this far, let us – you know, that will give us the seed money to get to the next step. Now, I, I wanted to quickly call back uh, our other guest real quick because he just called in, but um, I, I also want to get to the root of – and right after we talk to this guest, I want to get to the root of what got you started in being a fan. Okay. You know, just just loving the project and loving different things. The girls. Uh, hi, Justin. Justin, oh, hi. are you there? Did I uh, accidentally call you? Oh, no. D- did you accidentally call me? Uh, no, I don't. Maybe I did. I apologize. I was trying to call one of my actors. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, wh- I'm sorry. Was this is this Justin? This is Jeff. 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 I think I don't know. I, Hi, I Jeff. I, Jeff. We. Well, sorry. I think I might have gotten the wrong guy. Ho- sorry. Ho- sorry. Uh, Jeff. Wait, wait, wait. Jeff. Wait, don't hang up. Okay. Don't hang up on me. Uh, I, I got a live podcast going right now, Jeff. Oh, is that right? You got, am, am I live right now? Yes, you are. You're being seen in front of millions of people right now. Listen, I'm more than happy to join in on the conversation. What are you guys talking about? What's the subject? All right, well, we've got uh, Houston Huddleston with us. Uh, he is the uh, CEO and founder of a cool, really cool project. It's the Hollywood Science Fiction Museum that uh, is being kick-started and uh, is going to have all the amazing props and uh, it's also going to have uh, the the uh, Bridge D Enterprise, which is going to be interactive, allowing people to actually have missions on the bridge. What do you think? Is it open yet? It's not open yet, but you can you can go support it, and it will be in 2018, hopefully. 2015 actually is the first I'll opening. Be there if I could be the captain, and I just want to engage the board one time. What would be crazy awesome is I just want to say, you know, uh, like, you know, like, okay, listen, I want the uh, evasive pattern alpha. Okay, everybody, okay, watch the shields. Okay, now listen, back things off, and uh, let's see if we, okay, give me a scan of there. Yeah, oh, that would be awesome. That's like, that would be a dream come true. Excuse me a second. I'm going to drool for a moment. <laughs> so, I apologize. This is Jeff, who I who I do uh, improv and, and stuff with, uh, a, a fellow uh, thespian. Oh, ooh. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's awesome. I love. I watch. I do. Uh, I do catch your uh, your podcast. Well, you know when you guys are broadcasting live. Is Brent there? Is Brent on right now too? Brent is not on. He uh, he could not make it this evening. He was doing a show. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, he so picked. That's, that's crazy awesome. But uh, how did see the thing I'm wondering about is like is are these is this bridge going to be constructed or is it going to be uh, like real prop pieces from the show? Well, the cool thing is that uh, Houston actually rescued an actual bridge that was created for a ride that was that was pretty much in shambles, and the first Kickstarter he did. He actually got the funding for uh, to, to start restoring it. So this is going to be an actual, you know, amazing bridge it live in action and can be used. And I think I saw the one. It was at the uh, Star Trek ex- uh, that that uh, exhibit that they had over in Las Vegas. That's that's the other one, right? Is that, is that right, Houston? Part of it. We have part of that and part of the tour, but they were all okay. made at the same time. Yeah, they're all made at the same time, and uh, yeah. Sorry, I was. You know what? We're we're waiting for uh, one of my other guests to call in, and uh, and you called me instead. Sorry. My apologies. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had no idea. So okay, well you guys continue your podcast. I'm currently out and about. I do love this subject. I, I wish I was home listening. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for including me uh, in your in in the quick discussion. That was fun. 
No, it was, it's fun. Look up it's, HollywoodSciFi.com. That's the look. There's that's right. There. HollywoodSciFi.com. You can see the video all about it. Hall of Robots. Hall of Car. You check it out, Jeff. Just check it out. I sure will. I'm okay. Do it right now. That, that sounds awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Take care. All right. Bye. Sorry, I thought that was the guest calling in, but... Uh, I am so offended. I mean... I know, right? What is this, the Conan show? I mean, for God's sake. <laughs> People just call in randomly. Yeah. I'm going to try our guest one more time and see if he's available. Well, please do. Yeah, because um, he, he wanted to promote this amazing run, which just sounds absolutely fun to me. Um, I'm thinking about starting up a run walk superhero uh, club. I mean, what better way to be fit than to run with a cape? You feel stronger, and the workout goes by faster. Uh, true, and uh, and sweat. Well, he's not available. Anyways, so let's talk about the story. We, we, we don't we're need him. Good without him, yes. But anyways, check out the Super Run. I don't know if he's even going to be on tonight, but check out the Super Run. It's it's going all over the country, and uh, that does and sound cool. That really does sound cool. Yeah, I just it sounds like a fun would, project. It would be me in a costume, run a little bit, and then drop dead of a heart attack. That would be me. <laughs> I'm the same way. I am not a runner. I am a uh, I'm a walker, and then a, a heavy lover. breather. I'm not a runner. I'm a lover. <laughs> So, okay, Houston, where, where does this love and this passion for all things pop culture, fun, science fiction come from? What, what sparked it, and where, what's the fruition, you know? Uh, when I was five years old, my father uh, bribed me into singing uh, a song for a Christmas show that he had, and it was uh, called Santa's a Bionic Man. And it was trying to figure out how little kids can't figure out how every place that they go, there's Santa is there, you know? Wow. How, how does he get around from the mall to the so-and-so to the so-and-so? And well, he's bionic. He can just, you know, he runs to the next one. He runs to the next one. And, and uh, that music happens when he's running, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> so uh, my father uh, wrote this song for this musical that he wrote, uh, and originally it was for... Uh, Frank Sinatra was going to do it on, as a television special. And then uh, it was going to be Bing Crosby was going to do it as an animated show. And hmm. so, uh, and then Bing died, and it was, uh, yeah, so uh, my dad performed it uh, in a church. I was talking about it just the other day. Uh, and it was a big star of the thing with all this stuff. But uh, for the demo, I had to sing the kids' part of Santa as a Bionic Man, and my father gave me a $6 million man action figure for it. And, wow. uh And also some Star Wars stuff. And, you know, it was... Uh, so, yeah, I, I actually had the toys of Star Wars long before I ever saw the movie because uh, Star Wars, by the time I discovered the movie of Star Wars, it was years later... Um, Empire Strikes Back was already out, and you couldn't just see the original Star Wars. Um, so I had the toys, and I had a, an eight millimeter film loop of it, you know. And so it just it was natural. And watching old Star Trek on television, and uh, it was all over the place. I just loved anything that was really fun and exciting, and not boring and stupid and obvious. <laughs> And what is something uh, that would surprise people about you? I don't eat sweets. Um, there's no real reason. I just never wanted to. I chew on my straws. Um, I uh, I can I can turn into a troll. Really? Yes. You want to see me turn into a troll? Yes, please. Okay. One second. One, two, three. <laughs> That's amazing. Not Thank many you. people. Not many people have that skill. I uh, know. Well, you know, I was born with it. Turn into a, a '90s um, toy 
that that sold very well. Or I should say from the 80s, wasn't it? Uh, late 80s. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's see if you can change back, though. I, don't, I doubt... Will you still be wearing the red suspenders? Let's see. <laughs> and a Teletubby. Amazing. I mean, the, the, the range... Uh, I'm very talented. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I, uh, yes, I, uh, no, what other talents? Let's, I'm a good singer. Uh, I grew up, uh, my mother's a, a great singer, and she was, she sang on a lot of movies, uh, Airplane, Apocalypse Now, um, she uh, did arrangements for, uh, Frank Sinatra and for uh, Neil Diamond produced uh, vocal arrangements for Sweet Caroline, a bunch of stuff. Oh, uh, the Sky's in Love with You, the famous Bacharach record, a um, bunch of stuff like that. And my father was a famous songwriter, uh, wrote for Sinatra, Peggy Lee, Doris Day, uh, and Margaret, uh, gosh, Ella Fitzgerald, I did Disney movies, he wrote. Everybody Wants to Be a Cat for the Aristocats, and he was os uh, nominated for an Oscar for uh, the Disney movie Robin Hood. Um, and Which is so, yeah. my, one of my favorite Disney films of all really? time. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and my wife probably is so sick of hearing the songs from that film because I <laughs> love the music in that film. Yeah, well, um, yeah, there, uh, it was... My father, it was Roger Miller, mostly Roger Miller, and it was uh, Johnny Mercer wrote a song called Phony King of England for that. And oh, yeah. Johnny was a good friend of my father's. Johnny Johnny got my father into ASCAP. Uh, Mercer, if you don't know who Johnny Mercer is, look up his name. He wrote pretty much every popular song from 1930 through uh, you know 50s and 60s, from Moon River to... Uh, Gosh, uh, one more for my baby, one more for the road. I mean, just it's crazy how many songs, famous songs he wrote. Um, anyway, yeah, but uh, that's the world I grew up with, and so it was a very musical household, and so that may shock or completely bore people. <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> no, that that's amazing. So okay, so y you've got the kind of science fiction background. You're growing up in a very I, I, I would say a very musical household, you know, where, where kind of things come to life in front of you, you know, with music. It, that's very uh, applicable to science fiction, I would say, because every science fiction film has an amazing score. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can't think of any turkeys uh, from the use of the theremin in uh, Forbidden Planet to... Uh, some of what, uh, my gosh, the, the brilliant scores that uh, Bernard Herrmann did for the Harryhausen films, uh, Jason the Argonauts, and uh, did he, uh, yeah, I think he did the Sinbad movie as well. Um, hmm. And yeah, that's a certain caliber of composer, that's certain, uh, that I wish were still around. I'll, t I'll name a few of them. Uh, a good friend of mine whom I highly respect is a man named uh, Ron Jones, who is known now for doing music for Family Guy, and he also did the score to uh, uh, The Best of Both Worlds, uh, the two-parter on Next Gen, which hmm. is brilliant. That's, that's one of his masterpieces, I think. And he's the first person I called and told him, look, when we do this museum, I want you to score this thing. I want you to, uh, I want this to be like Disneyland in concept used to be where each, it still is a little bit, but yeah. each land has a different score. Each, uh, obviously if you're in the alien room, it's going to be the music, the creepy music from Aliens by Jerry Goldsmith. If you go to Star Wars, it's going to be John Williams. If you go to Star Trek, it's uh, mostly going to be, uh, it can be all over the place, because uh, from the 
uh, famous uh, Alexander Courage, etc. But you go to the Hall of Robots, you go to the Hall of Cars, you go to in the main lobby, you go to whatever the Hall of Spaceships, the the makeup room. What's the music going to be? What is the theme? Uh, I wanted to have a musical theme score that's that doesn't whack you on the head with a sledgehammer. Is more subtle than that. Right. But he's the most talented composer I know right now uh, that I mm. that I personally know, and uh, and also I think one of the most brilliant composers period right now. And I told him that I said, look, uh, you know, and he said, call me when you got money. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. <laughs> he, he said, I'll me. wait for the check in the mail. Yeah, and I'll... Not like that at all. Um, <laughs> he he loved the idea, and I loved for him to to do that, and that that's what I want. I want there to be synergy between the rooms, and I want there to be a complete adventure when you go to our museum. I don't want it to be a boring, stupid museum that's uh, stagnant. I want it to be Nothing stagnant. about this museum sounds boring. The people that go to this museum and are bored are most likely... Actually, Dead. I don't know. I, I don't know one person... Dead. <laughs> would even be like, yeah, I'm not into that. Yeah, I can't think of one person. Mm. So I don't know. Well, I think it's going to be successful. Even the girlfriends of some guy that the guy's into it and the girlfriend's kind of, eh, even she'll want to dress up and pose. And, yeah. you know, no matter how boring uh, a person, <laughs> I was going to say, no matter how boring a person is going to be, uh, no matter how limited their tastes are in... That's a Whatever. nice PC way to say that. Yeah. Uh, well, I've met I've met people who said that they never. I I met. Oh gosh, it broke my heart. I I met this beautiful girl on a plane once, and she told me that she didn't watch movies because she couldn't pull herself out of it that she's just watching actors acting. Any movies. Wow. And I I thought, wow, what part of her brain isn't accepting of the suspension of disbelief right. to for any movie period and how i thought how sad but and how much she's missed out on i mean man she would get her caught up she would be a long time <laughs> yeah, yeah i i just couldn't i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe listening to this beautiful young girl telling me this and she was very intelligent she wasn't stupid she was uh uh, I, I can't remember. I think she was a mathematician, or I can't remember what she did, but it was something non-show business. But regardless of that, I think even that girl would have would come to our museum and find something that would enjoy uh, that she would enjoy or find interesting or fascinating or bring her kids to it. Whatever, you know. Now I gotta ask you. Because I, I go to a lot of museums. I love the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. And what I really like about museums is sometimes they have like a rotating exhibit like that will come out every once in a while. Is there going to be something like that? You know, like a... Uh... Definitely not. No. I'm no? Of course, yeah. No, I mean, uh, in fact, that's one of the draws of what we're doing because there are certain props that Universal has and that Warner has that... Yeah. We can only get in, in a temporary uh, function, and Sony as well. They have a Sony prop room that, uh, you know, we can bring the, the guns, have a whole guns exhibit, phasers, guns, rifles, whatever, for the gun from Men in Black, the rifle from uh, the original TOS, uh, the pilot of the cage uh, that was just auctioned recently. You know, things like that, that people would want to see. Uh, yeah. Very exciting, but more importantly, and this is the really cool part, that involves Hollywood, involves uh, the studios in particular. I wanted to give studios and production companies and films uh, a way to promote their films in a way that Hollywood, there's nothing in Hollywood that allows it. There are little bits and pieces of that, but my thought is we're going to be near uh, our final location, which we're still looking for, but it has to be near a a man's Chinese or a Cinerama Dome or 
El Capitan, some theater where they have tons of premieres, where it's known for their premieres. Right. So when they finish that premiere, they'll go out the door, through the lobby, out the door, walk down the street, down the block, next door, across the street, whatever it is. There's our museum. Have the after party in our – we're going to have this spaceship restaurant. That's another thing. We haven't talked about that yet, but it's – Wow. That, going to be so awesome you're going to be teleported into the restaurant and you're going to be aboard the spaceship that's all i'm going to say but get out of town yeah that hey when you're when your board of directors are some of those brilliant people in science fiction <laughs> really you really think we're not going to come up with something like Sky's that? the limit right yeah exactly so they go to our museum have the after party get a few drinks and then go to our open traveling exhibit room and there are all the props from that movie. There's all the concept art all over the walls. There's the costumes. There's wow. whatever. And that will stay in that room for, say, a month. You know. And so the next Tom Cruise sci-fi movie that there happens to be, the next G.J. Uh, Abrams, whatever it happens yeah. to be, that will be the extension of after they have their Hollywood premiere. Boom. At our museum. Open it up to the studios and to Hollywood. That's a fantastic double-edged sword because you got promotions going on for these uh, amazing films. That's basically bar none. You you probably can't really get anywhere else. Uh, you know, for and, and then of course you got the fans who go, "Hey, this is brand new. This is new. This came out. This is out right now. Let's mm -hmm. we can look at some props and amazing things from the film." And it's it's a year in front of us. A lot of times, the props and the costumes and the art behind it is better than the films. I hate to say, but still, it sure. promotes those things. Seeing um, it up close and oh my gosh! Amazing. Oh, it's incredible! It's a, did you guys did you see or hear about the bubble ship from? Uh, it starts with an E. It's a Tom Cruise film. Oblivion. Oblivion. Oh yeah, yeah. E. It starts with an E. It's called Oblivion. Anyway, um, Oblivion. Yeah. Yeah, Oblivion. Yes, uh, the bubble ship from that movie was an actual full-size prop, and they had that at last year's WonderCon, and everyone was drooling. It was such an incredible prop, and yeah. I, I immediately called Universal and I said, "So, when we open up our museum, uh, is that still around?" They said, "Yeah, it's in the <laughs> warehouse." I said, "You got it, man." I, you know, and people may nice. not remember the movie, but they'll see that prop and it will help with whatever franchise it is, whatever, you know. First of all, I love that film. And secondly, uh, that, that whole bubble thing, I, I think is, is a cool concept anyways, for a, a future like thing that goes into space, you know, we mm -hmm. could actually invent that. Like that's what I'm talking about. The, the connection to fantasy and reality is amazing. Right, right. No, it's – hey, uh, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. One of the first meetings I ever had with a nonprofit guy, I knew I wasn't going to get any money from him. So he said, well, you can't be all things to everybody, and I said, why not? That, and I, that, I believe that. I truly yeah. believe it. No, you can't teach a, a, a four-course meal of education. You can't do – you can't give someone a diploma for what we're going to have in our museum. But it will lead them in a direction where they can go to college and they can get a, a whatever 101 and they can follow through with their career. This yeah. museum will do that. This museum will give them options to their creativity. That's If, if we can do that, you know, then I, I have a purpose for being on this earth. <laughs> All right. Your 22nd commercial, why should people support this project? And what what is it that is so captivating about it? We are creating the first museum in the world that will teach real science through science fiction. It will also teach filmmaking. It will also be the mecca of all science fiction. It will have Star Trek, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Doctor Who, Firefly, Stargate, Farscape, you name it. Everything in this from Hall of Robots to Hall of Spaceships to Hall of Cars. And there's nothing like this in the world. And we're better, uh, as Colin Baker, Doctor Who, the sixth doctor told me, we're better of a place than Hollywood. Love it. 
I I am sold. <laughs> Me too. Wow. <laughs> I am sold. Um. So that's awesome, man. I, okay. Let Let's. So go support this project. Go to the Kickstarter. What What's the What are the websites they can go to? They can go to HollywoodSciFi.com. Uh, okay. Hollywood S S C I F I uh, or S Y F Y. We got all domain names for it. And there's no bad way to spell it that you can't get to us. And or go to Kickstarter or uh, just type in Hollywood Science Fiction Museum or Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum on Google, Yahoo, whatever. You're gonna find more sites than you probably wish to find about us. And <laughs> we're also on Kickstarter and just help support us. Uh, help. Help this, help make this a reality. It's really down to the fans right now. Because once we have that money, that's when we can hit the ground running to the things that need to be done to get the big money from all the corporations, who incidentally are already interested in what we're doing. But we can't do those meetings until we have the pieces of the puzzle laid out for them. That's where that Kickstarter money will go. That makes sense, and and you've got some amazing uh, incentives. So you're not, it's not like you're getting nothing. You're getting some amazing stuff, including, which I think is really cool, every donation, regardless of the amount, receives one free ticket to the 2015 Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum, uh, which is pretty cool. So 366 backers as of right now, and you've got 24 days to go. I mean, I don't. I, I see this happening, man. It's Are you? Scary. I I just I'm always nervous when it in, in the fifth day if it hasn't already reached the limit I get nervous. But I don't know. I, I just there are some big things we've yet to announce that we will be in the next week or so. So um, you know, hopefully I it just yeah my ulcer just will continue to grow until it reaches the limit. <laughs> Well, uh, that's understand. I, I can't thank you enough, man, for coming on and, and giving us uh, this amazing uh, glimpse at what we have to look forward to and what we need to support. Uh, we got a couple of other things on the show real quick, and these are really quick-fire things because uh, I know we've been on for a little while, and I really appreciate you taking the time. It's yeah, called you're, probably, you're probably sick of me by now, so yeah. <laughs> I... No, no, not at all, actually. Uh, you're sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... You can disconnect yourself from yourself. Um, versus uh, is a little thing that we do on our show. It's basically nerd talk where you take a non-fiction, fictional character from uh, two different universes or the same universe or, or whatnot, anything really, and you versus each other in, in a matchup uh, head-on uh, who would win hand-to-hand combat or whatnot. So for you, because, you know, Star Trek, obviously, you know what I'm going to pick. It's Kirk versus Picard. Who would win in a, uh, a throwdown? In a throwdown, with or without weapons? <sighs> Let's give them weapons, because, I mean, you know, what, what's, a, what's a fight well, without a weapon? Well, hand-to-hand, -hand, but hand-to-hand, sure. -hand, I think Kirk. Okay. Uh, weapon to weapon, uh, speaking phaser to phaser, I would say uh, it would be evenly matched. It's hard. It would be whoever has the handicap. But um, as far as the quick thinking wit of the thing, I sorry to say it would be Picard. Uh, sorry, Kirk lovers. But uh, yeah, I or, or they may just you know get thrown off of a bridge. <laughs> Uh, well, isn't that the fight those. that we really wanted, you know, in Generations? We really wanted them to, you know, it's like Batman versus Superman, uh, you know, the newest film. Of All course, right, we're going to have you. them fight. I asked, I asked Ronald D. Moore this question. What the hell? I mean, <laughs> Ron Moore is a great, awesome guy, and I just asked him, what the hell is with the ending of Generations? And he said, okay. I'll tell you exactly. And I don't know if you've heard this story. Most people haven't heard this story. No. When Brandon Braga and Ronald D. Moore were pitching the original uh, poster and story of Generations, you got the Enterprise D and you got the TOS Enterprise head to head. And there's Kirk on his bridge. And there's Picard on his bridge. And, and wow. Kirk... 
Kirk dies on his bridge, and some very wise Paramount executive, who probably never even seen the show, said, Yes! Kirk dies on a bridge! Wait, what? Yeah, he falls off of a bridge and he dies! Oh, no! Seriously? <laughs> and that was the germination of how this... <sighs> How that ending, isn't it? So now uh, Bill Shatner said his, his last word should have been bridge on the captain. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But no, that, that, was, that was the seed uh, that was sown, unfortunately. And Ron Moore knew that they would never go for the two ships fighting each other, but what an awesome poster that would have made and what a oh, brilliant yeah. ending. But what would have paired them up against each other that they would have had to be fighting each other to begin with and would the Enterprise, the original Enterprise shields hold up to the phaser power, but, you know, that that would be the problem. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I hate that, I hate to think of that about that because I love both of them, you know? <laughs> I As know, you don't want any the of them to really lose. Yeah. <laughs> can't, they just be, can't they just be friends? Can't we all just be friends? Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I would, uh, I would pick, um, I would pick Picard. And I, I've just always been a Picard fan. Um, it's not because I'm younger, folks. I know who all the, the, the old generation fan or the, uh, the old Star Trek fans are going, oh, you whippersnappers and you're Picard loving. But uh, no, truthfully, I, I think uh, Picard has, um, I don't know, he has an edge. Uh, and it may be because he has no hair and there's no really edge. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, but, I, but Kirk's more fisticuffs. You know, Kirk's more yes. rough and ready rumble time and, uh, you know, his famous Kirk uh, Gorn moves and all that. You know, Kirk, I don't know. Uh, and Picard is calculated. Uh, I yes, guess you could exactly. say. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so <laughs> Collector's yeah. Corner is another thing we do on the show. Houston, okay. Where, and I kind of gave you a little heads up on this, we just share something from our collection that, we, uh, that we've collected over the years. Uh, we've had some amazing things on the show. We've had uh, a brick from the Yellow Brick Road from the most recent Oz movie. We've had... Wow. We've had some crazy stuff on the show, you know. Uh, we, I've, last week was ridiculous. First of all, the guy pulls out the head of uh, the old school Raphael uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live action head that he created, but Vanilla Ice signed the top of it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you blew me out of the water there. Then he also mentions at the end of the podcast, oh, yeah, by the way, I also have a, a full-size uh, RoboCop suit that was uh, in RoboCop 3, uh, as actually used on set. Yeah, it's in my garage. I, don't, I, can't, I guess i got to pull it out sometime. Like, you just got it laying around like, Where is hello? this guy? Where is this guy? <laughs> yeah, you yeah, might need to number. contact him. Yeah, right, exactly right. Yeah. No, his name is uh, Daniel Bravo, as I mentioned right, before. Right, right. That's amazing. He's, a, he's an amazing uh, costume creator, and uh, he's created uh, basically the molds from the old school Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles films, uh, live action films, and they look, I mean, screen accurate. And he's created Predator uh, costumes. I mean, the guy's amazing. And he does this all like in his garage because he wants to. Yeah, that that talent is something that's so beyond me. I, I just drool and stand in awe. I know. It's it's amazing. So anyways, that's what we do on our show. Um, I'll get mine out of the way because it's not very, like, ex I'm sure you're going to blow me out of the water, but whatever. Oh, um, I probably won't. <laughs> I just went to the, uh, the Motor City Comic Con here in town in, uh, in Detroit area, and uh, I met an amazing um, uh, creator, comic book creator, his name is Sean Manning, and uh, he told me about this uh, this graphic novel. It's called Interesting Drug, and um, the concept is um, time travel through prescription drug. 
<laughs> I know, right? Like yeah. immediately sold me on the book. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm I'm buying one. Um, uh, and and so the the illustrations are very, very cool. Um, uh, just to give, kind of give you an idea, a glimpse. Um. It's just different, and it's, it's something I haven't seen, and I haven't read it yet. I'm really looking forward to it because it's part of my summer reading. But uh, I love meeting new artists and new uh, comic book authors and creators. And uh, when I, I met, I have no money him, to buy stuff. That's my problem. I, I mean, well, that's the thing is, you know, you only have so much when you go to these conventions, and you're like, okay, I gotta spend this wisely. What am I gonna? So meeting this guy, and immediately when he told me the concept of this, I'm like. Dude, no brainer. I am buying this, and he signed it, and it was really cool. So, anyways, uh, Sean Manning's interesting drug, and I got a, a, a like a pre, uh, I don't know, pre-released copy of this because I guess it didn't actually go uh, uh, when wide distribution until this week. So, hmm. awesome. Well, Sir? I just want to first say that I don't collect things. I mean, I, I'm not. A quote-unquote collector of, of stuff, you know. Yeah, I, it doesn't look like you do. I, uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's uh, not something that you know is uh, something that I, I normally you know, go after. And I, I gotta say too that I you know I I poo poo people who that who uh, do collect <laughs> stuff because uh, it it's just it's, it's an obsession. You know, and those sort of of people. Uh, you know, and and furthermore, uh, I I just uh, I I think that it's you know I just say grow the hell up. You know, just grow the hell up. And uh, you know, I I I, just, I find those people offensive. Just actually offensive. You know, I I meet those types of people, and it's like, oh, for God's sake, you know, you don't have anything better to do with your money. The people that don't take it out of the box. Yeah, those. Uh... Yeah, and uh, displayed on their shelves, man. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So um, uh, that said, um, no, I, I'm afraid I, I can't help you. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but as uh, Flip Wilson uh, or Geraldine might say. Don't touch me! You don't know me that well. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, it's been fun, and uh, yes. yeah, I, I'm I'm glad you got uh, we got a late start because I I couldn't uh, log into uh, my uh, Google account. <laughs> oh, but um, no worries, yeah, no worries. it's been a pleasure meeting you, and thanks for promoting us. And yeah, just all I. You know, I I don't have any money right now. I I can't afford uh, you know anything. But if you can spread the word, that's all I ask anyone to do. Uh, Absolutely. I think this is something. We'll, that we'll needs actually to put happen. the link up again to the uh, the Kickstarter on our website, and on the uh, throughout the campaign of the the Kickstarter. But we'll also put it on our Facebook page. Oh, that'd be great. So. Oh, oh, one last thing. Uh, sure. This is um, a rather rare toy. This is uh, Archie Bunker's grandson. Wow! And uh, it's it was the very first anatomically correct toy, Joey Stivic. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's yeah anything with Archie Bunker on the front of it that's a, a toy in, that you could have found in kids' toys shop. <laughs> the audacity of that is just brilliant to me. <laughs> and I, I found Complete. it in mint condition. Uh, I'm sure most of them are mint condition. I mean, who the hell would play with that? <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, yeah, Joey Stivic, Archie Bunker's grandson. Archie Bunker's grandson. Folks, say, you heard it here YouTube. first. Look on YouTube. You'll find a commercial for it, and it's this sort of the very first anatomically correct toy. <laughs> <laughs> like that's their selling point. Yeah, right. Oh, exactly. well, get me one right now. <laughs> For my kids, yeah, I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. Well, thanks it's so great much. meeting you, Houston. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck on the campaign. And we'll spread the word, and uh, hopefully, we'll be uh, visiting you at uh, 2015. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> if I'm not dead, yes, please. <laughs>
Thank All you. right. Take care, sir. Um, feel free to uh, hang up uh, when you're ready. I'm going to hang up right now. <laughs> Click. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take care, though. Thank you. No problem. I don't. I think Houston is uh, is is gone, but uh, not too sure. But anyways, um, so anyways, awesome guest. Uh, you guys really need to support this Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it's it's something that for the nerdum community, but I think even larger than that. I think this is a as a concept that I would visit. I would actually go. Look, look I, I'm a big fan of movies and stuff, and for years people have been telling me, you got to go to Hollywood, yeah, man. And then I like actually look at people's reviews of going there, and usually it's, oh, a big disappointment. Nothing really to see here but a, you know, a theater and some uh, horribly uh, dressed characters uh, hustling people for photos. And uh, this is a project that would get me to actually go there and be a destination that I would actually visit. Besides, you know, I'm a big Disney fanatic. This would be a, a place that would draw me to it. Uh, so go support it. Uh, I believe they've, they've got... Let me go back and uh, see how many days left they've got on this. Only 24 days left, but I mean they've already got 25,000, uh, uh, close to 26,000 dollars raised. It's a pretty good chunk of change. Their goal is 82,000, and uh, a lot of that is, as uh, Houston mentioned, is going to go to uh, getting to the next level where they can actually go to some of these uh, big name companies pitch the concept and hopefully get people to buy into it and uh, get excited about it. So go uh, check out this project uh, and uh, let us know, um, you know what awesome goodies that you're getting. Uh, so anyways, Cinephile this week, I, I saw Godzilla. Um, it was a tough sell to my wife to go see this film because... When I met my wife for the first time, she told me she's never seen any rated R films. So I knew right off the bat she'd never seen anything good. No, she's kidding. No, but I knew she'd never seen a lot of, of stuff. She was a kid who was kind of, you know, the go outside and play type of kids where I was like uh, stay in and watch a bunch of nerdy stuff kids. I mean, I was I grew up on... Quantum Leap and MacGyver was shows that I would watch after school. I was a complete nerd. Anyways, so when I heard that they were making another Godzilla film, I really got nervous. You know, Matthew Broderick, um, and it's no fault of his because really the script is completely ridiculous. But having uh, Matthew Broderick as the the main lead was even kind of f even funnier. But the the look of that that Godzilla was just off. It was just completely off. It was like the spiky Tyrannosaurus Rex, but like hunched over, had back problems Godzilla. This uh, new Godzilla, when I had first seen the teaser trailers, I got supremely excited about. Because A, what they, they did one of my favorite things was taking... Um, history and bringing it into a fictional thing like this. So I'll give you a, for instance, they, they mention in the movie and in the teaser trailer that, you know, those, those amazing, you know, tests that we did with the A-bombs back in the day, those weren't tests. They were trying to kill Godzilla. Like, like, I was like, what? That That's real? They didn't kill God? No, I was completely buying into the fiction, nonfiction uh, draw. Uh, but 
but it worked for me, and I was like, I was on board. Then I find out that uh, Homeboy from Baking, Breaking Bad's gonna be on it. Now I'm like, all right, I, I'm now I'm really listening. Then they show pictures of what Godzilla looks like, and I go, yes, sir. We have a Godzilla that looks remotely. I wouldn't say remotely. It looks pretty accurate to what the old school Godzilla looks like, only a little bit better because, let's face it, the things we can do today, we couldn't do back then. I mean, the, the, back then they had literally something moving and, you know, a little puppet. And So anyways, this film, and spoiler alert, if anyone wants to tune out now, fine, do it. One, two, three, go. All right, Godzilla. The, f- the the reviews that I read before I got to see this film was there's not enough Godzilla in it. Look, okay, the movie's called Godzilla. That doesn't mean Godzilla is going to be in every frame of the film. There's bad guys in the film. There's the military in the film. There's the people that are getting trampled on. There's the city, there's the story. What I, People, you, you've got to give it... Are, are, we not be, are we being a little bit critical nowadays that uh, we can't get past the fact that a movie called Godzilla doesn't have Godzilla in every frame? Get a life, people. They, they told a fantastic story. It had depth. It had character development. It made you fall in love with Godzilla by the end. You were cheering for him, just like the old school films when he used to help out the the people of uh, Japan. Why? Why? I mean, this film was so good. I mean, and the emotional connection that they had to the characters you know, the fact that the, the mom dies, you know. And by the way, I couldn't tell who the 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 son of um, Brian Cranston's character was until, like, at the end of the movie, I'm like, what is he in? He looks so... F- kick-ass. He's kick-ass. And he doesn't act like kick-ass at all in the film. That's what threw me off is, man, this guy is a really good actor. And so, anyways, watched the film, absolutely loved it, felt connected to the characters, felt connected to um, Godzilla, which is pretty good since it's a CG character, but you end up rooting for him. Uh, it had all the, the beauty of Godzilla from before to the lighting up uh, when he's about to spew a bunch of uh, radioactive fire out of his mouth. Um, it, it just it, it had every depth of a great film, and, and not just a great film, but a great monster film. And uh, people are saying, oh, why there shouldn't be another um, Godzilla sequel? You know what? <laughs> Why ruin something that is so fantastic with your your comments? I mean, this is the same people that aren't giving Ben Affleck a chance before he actually is able to go on screen and show them what he can do. And, of course, when he does, there'll be a bunch of people who hate it because, for whatever reason, they, uh, people get stuck on these these little things. And in my opinion, it, it's it's pointless. Enjoy the ride. Go into a movie with low expectations and wanting to just have fun. Chances are you're going to walk out of the movie every time having fun. If you go into it going, I'm going to write down everything I dislike about this film. You could sit there all day and pick it apart. It's a two and a half hour, sometimes even shorter than that, uh, piece of art. And uh, you really should just lighten up. So g- go see Godzilla. Enjoy it. Um, let me know what you think. If you didn't like it, be honest. Uh, hey, I, I don't like everything I see, which what we're going to get to right now. In the tube this week, 
everyone's been telling me to watch Game of Thrones. I have never have because I don't have HBO, and quite frankly, the concept was it's going to be a medieval times, and we're going to... Uh, okay, so I'm a little bit intrigued. So I start watching it just recently. My, uh, I, was, I was thankful that I could watch it on the Internet. So I watch Game of Thrones on the Internet. I'm, I'm, I'm four episodes in right now. Okay, and I gotta tell ya, and I mentioned this on Facebook, and everyone blasted me. You gotta stick with it, but I just couldn't get connected to the characters. In my opinion, the story was way too huge of a of a story. I mean, the the scope of the story is more um, of like a trilogy movie, you know. Uh, because there's so many different kingdoms and there's so many different characters and this person's doing something to that person and you've really got to almost have a chart to kind of figure out what's going on. Now, I'm, I'm being critical of it because there's parts that I like about it. There's, there's good parts about the show. I see why people are kind of into it, but... I got to tell you, about three episodes in, I was like, am I going to keep watching this? And I watched the fourth episode, and then I'm like, okay, you know what? Now I'm going to take it to the people. Went on Facebook, said, hey, guys, I'm four episodes in. Why is this show not... Dude, I did the same thing. You've got to stick with it. Stick with it. It's going to pay off in the end. And so here I am. I'm going to be watching the rest of Game of Thrones Season 1. Uh, probably within the next week or so, and uh, I'm excited. I'm I'm excited to hopefully see a payoff here because right now I'm I'm wondering um, if I I've, I've been uh, hoodwinked, if you will, uh, by the the fandom frenzy of uh, of Game of Thrones. So let me know what you think about Game of Thrones are you watching it what's what's your perception did you have the same reaction uh, and uh, now everyone's talking about the new seasons and I really good thing I'm not hearing a lot of details but they're like oh man you you gotta see the new episode and so I'm like okay I really gotta catch up so any who's it's what's it's thanks a lot um, someone actually recommended us seeing Game of Thrones because I think I mentioned on a previous show that I had never seen it, and they said, you got to watch it, Brian. You, you can't be doing a nerd podcast without talking about Game of Thrones. So, And I know Brent's been watching it, so Brent can actually have a conversation about this when he's back on with us. Um, so, yeah, so really exciting. Mike, um, just so you guys know, Mike is taking a little bit of a leave of absence from uh, the Not So Cool Kids podcast podcast. Uh, for personal reasons, I don't even know what they were, but I just know that he said, I need a little time, and I'm giving it to him. So uh, I, I love Mike, and I love his opinions, and I love him on the show, so hopefully we'll get Mike back soon. Um, good, exciting news, though, is that we are going to be looking for some new hosts. Um, the Not So Cool Kids podcast is, is going upward very quickly. Um and uh, is snowballing out of control, which is great. Um, this is something that started as a podcast, and hopefully it's going to become something a little bit more. But I'm going to tap into the community and try to find at least uh, probably about maybe three or four more hosts that are really dedicated to doing the show and uh, giving a great, uh, you know, interview to the our guests every week, but also doing some great uh, talk afterwards about different subjects like Godzilla and Game of Thrones and stuff like that. So if you are interested, contact us at notsocoolkidspodcast at gmail.com. You can also contact us through our website, through our contact link, and it would give you a little uh, display where you can fill in the information and uh, send us some information about you, why you think you should be a host on the show, we're going to be holding auditions. Uh, I haven't uh, finalized any details yet, but we're going to be doing some auditions, and the auditions are basically just to get an idea of uh, what your commitment level is, um, 
why you should be on the show. You know, we want people on the show who are uh, somewhat educated in at least one or two fandoms, and uh, obviously collectors are always welcome. Um, so, yeah, so if you're interested, contact us, reach out to us. Thank you for uh, watching every week. We didn't have any live questions again. I don't know why. Uh, there are a lot of people watching live, but that's okay. That's all right. A lot of people watch us uh, after it goes up to YouTube, so that's fine. Uh, we would love for people to be asking questions in real time for our guests. So next time you see a live podcast uh, shooting up to the uh, the web on Thursdays, usually around 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, check it out. Check it out and uh, ask some questions of our guests. Thanks a lot to our uh, our guests this week, Houston uh, Huddleston, and uh, I'm sad that uh, Justin couldn't make it on with us uh, to talk about the Super Run. Thanks for the random uh, talk to Jeff Porter, who uh, who called in accidentally to the the show. But um, you know, maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll have uh, Jeff on the future as as a as a uh, co-host. So thanks a lot, and um, stay nerdy, my friends. Peace. <laughs>